So good afternoon, Dubai. Okay, thank you. Uh, so multi-bagger formula, right? So first of all, just to set the tone, I said, like, what is multi-bagger? Multi-bagger is basically, you know, some a stock which say goes more than double, so two x or more, right? Uh, just a couple of days back, uh, someone from my team had sent a, you know, our performance. Uh, on one of the group, and uh, one had uh, one of the persons on the group who responded, you know what, uh, I would rather invest in stocks uh, that, you know, really do well and take good positions in it. And these names were IRFC, RVNL, you know, and all of them, they said it went up 500%, of course. I was wanting to ask him, how much did you make in this same stock? <laughs> because the stock went up 500%, but the question is, you know, when you got in and did you get out at the right time before, you know, it maybe uh, at some point things plunge, right? So, uh, so I think where I'm coming from is also to say, it's not just about, you know, finding that one stock, right? It's about how can we make it as a process? How can we also ensure that we sort of manage our risk on it, right? So, and, and so as we go forward, that's something that, uh, you know, you actually, it starts adding to your portfolio because it's not that one is a multi-bagger, but the other goes down so sharply and compensates for it, right? Uh, so you may say what authority we have in saying, talking about multi-baggers. So I said, okay, let me put up that list. And this is the average price, okay? Of course, uh, What's interesting is the time frame. I think REC was the best, so we so we also did a PSU stock, you know, and it it did well. Okay, and and the point to make out here is that uh, when I'm looking at here, I'm saying average, right? I'll have another slide when I say, you know, from start to end, right? And uh, this also talks about managing risk from our side and how we manage it because. We've not necessarily participated in the whole journey because we have exited in phases. We have also entered in phases, right? Because we want to manage risk. And so the whole point is, how am I able to do it in a way which also ensures that I manage risk? At the same time, it becomes repeatable and then it actually adds value to your portfolio, right? So uh, I think Starting off with, you know, the basics on where that comes from and, and I think all of you uh, are here also because of the India growth story and stuff. I'm not going to spend too much of time, but just to set context, I think the environment, the, uh, you know, looking at the economic trends and stuff like that becomes, you know, important for us as you sort of pick stocks and also, you know, catch a trend that possibly will also help and you have tailwinds to uh, get it up into a multi-bagger. So, uh, there are a lot of, you know, schemes that the government has come up with, I think, the, and, and uh, there's a lot happening, right? So, I'm not going to spend too much of time, but infrastructure, manufacturing, definitely are places where government has spent a lot of time. Uh, there's been some bit of reform push. Uh, again, I don't want to go one by one. Uh, then probably you'll fall asleep. <laughs> so, uh, but th there are a lot of lot of things which are happening out there, and uh, I think the the reforms pushes the other. Okay, exports also interestingly are going up. Okay, and if you look at it as a percentage and and a lot of other parameters, both interestingly if you see merchandise, right? So earlier I think services was the one which was buzzing and trending. So now you will find merchandise, manufacturing, all of them, which, you know, are beginning to sort of move as well. Uh, the structural growth story, again, uh, it's interesting to see the volume of CapEx and, you know, which is happening uh, by the government as well. And we've seen globally, uh, I think Dubai is a classic example where you have infrastructure, right? Then you actually see that the economy grows. Right? Uh, also, the second part of it is about, you know, to look at, I think one thing which is very core for India is the demographics, right? 
Okay. For some reason, this chart has not come out well. <laughs> okay, so I think it's lost in the technology translation. But but the whole point that you know one is making is uh, you will find the household income right is going from uh, you know levels which are very low, and you're finding more and more HNIs coming in. And one of the things that one would like to again emphasize here is the in terms of demographics is the age, right? So you see, uh, you know, you have the median age is 28, right? And uh, if you went and studied the U.S., for example, and when it saw its baby boomers, right, the whole uh, possible two decades of growth post that, right, was when the U.S. hit median age of 30, right? And why is that? Because so many people are coming into consumption. I think the youngsters, because if you're saying median age, you mean there are a whole lot of people who are, you know, 40, 50, 60, all of them. But the number of them who are not even in the working age, right? So now when they come into the working age, you actually have income and that sort of, you know, aids the consumption. And when it's wider and broader at a, you know, country level, it really, you know, uh, takes off. And this sort of correlates also to while you see that journey, right? And uh, if you again study, go and study back in, the t in terms of the US, and we also saw earlier, you know, uh, consumer disc discretionary uh, that they were talking about, and this is a chart which actually substantiates that, that as we go forward from basic, you'll find that you'll sort of go higher and higher in the uh, consumer discretionary. Okay, uh, so you'll find the, you know, again, data where, you know, the growth that you see, right, will uh, move away from, you know, some of the, the higher percentages you see will be going towards non-grocery retail, right? So, so that's the whole point of, uh, you know, going in that direction. So I'll come back to the main point of, you know, uh, how do you identify a multi-bagger? Now you saw the environment, you saw the trends, all of that are there. It'll probably help you get into which sector that you want to be. Okay, but how do you identify a multi-bagger? Okay, uh, you may say, what has this got to do with multi-baggers? Investment process, right? I think it's important to see how you know, you can do things in a structured way and at least, and, and some of these are uh, the ways that we manage, you know, clients' money as part of our PMS, okay, is, is we have an uh, investment process which basically, you know, right from screening the whole universe of companies, you, you make it more difficult for yourself to invest into these companies, right, because you want the best quality out there. Okay, the screener, uh, you start off with that, get down to a set of companies, we do come down to about 125 companies and there we go deeper. Okay, there in terms of the scorecard, we actually do a ranking of each of the companies that comes through our screener. Okay, uh, the second step of that is then we go, you know, grounds up to see, you know, which, what are the tailwinds that the company has, what is the strategic direction, you know, is the environment aiding, and, uh, you know, so, so various other factors where we study the company in detail and do we think that they are going to transform, uh, are they going to grow, right? So we then look at risk management. I think one thing that I will capture is some bit about risk. Okay, I think Shankar was saying, you know, have a few minutes on risk. So I have a few minutes on risk, okay, uh, both here and towards the end. Because I think, you know, you may have some of those companies that do very well for you, but the question is, are you able to do it on your average? And that comes down to, you know, risk management. Uh, and uh, so we do a forensic before we even enter into a company and then we have a process where we track on a periodic basis post, you know, having the companies on. And we, the last is the pendulum where valuations become important, right? So it's, it's also about, you know, the safety that you have of valuations. Uh, sometimes it goes crazy and, and those are times that we jump off and move on to you know some other bus. So uh, so within the overall process, what uh, we looked at, especially for mid and small caps, is to say how do we achieve this multi bagger We saw success in a few of them. and said how do we make it a process in itself? Okay, so so broadly, if you see, there are two parts to it. Okay, one is do I think that the earnings growth of the company is going to double in the next say three to four years, right? Because if by earnings, I'm saying the profit growth is 
at least double, right? It, it double, the profits double. So if that happens over the three years or four years, then normally you would expect the stock price also to sort of double and probably more than that. Okay, so the other part is about value, right? So how do you also identify some of these companies where say the P ratio is lower, right? And the valuations are better. So not only do you get the growth because of earnings, but if you get a PE expansion, right, you probably get a much larger multi-bagger out there. And so, so that's the basic thing about, you know, a combination of earnings growth and valuations. And this is, uh, and like I told you, I will, I will share with you also with beginning to end, right? So some of these have even, you know, delivered four to six X, okay, from the time that we, you know, started to exit the stock, right? And uh, yes, we made a multi uh, IRCTC was a multi bagger much earlier, not in this cycle, but in the earlier cycle. Okay, and, and you'll see that the P ratio actually moved from 35 to 105, right? And on the same time, you'll find that earnings growth also doubled in that period. So, combination of these, you ended up seeing that uh, multi bagger in terms of the from the beginning to end, uh, from the time that we entered and discovered the stock to uh, when we finally exited. Right? And so how do we go about it, right? So like I said, okay, look at earnings, look at P, but you know, when you study companies, we look at growth at a value. Okay, so not, uh, you know, you may have a con you know, continuous or consistent compounder, right? So you may have one which really does well in the long term. But if we don't see a PE expansion, you may not have that type of, you know, multi-bagger and that value uh, coming back to yourself. This, I spoke about process, so I don't have to talk any more about it. But we also look at what are the modes of the company, what are the competitive advantage, and also the valuation. Guardrails is, you know, we said if value is, uh, if P ratio comes, say, just simplistically, and this is just, a, we probably go a lot more into, you know, even valuing the company and looking at it. But we set certain buy-ins for ourselves. This is a place where we are willing to buy, but this is a place where we have to sell. Okay, and, and so I thought I'll give a bit of a case study on APL Apollo tubes and just to give you a you know, perspective also how and when we sort of exit something, okay? Uh, and, and the point is there's a lot of hard work that needs to go into it. So if you are investing into stocks, okay, it's not that I invested, okay, it's gone up. Uh, somebody asked me today during a conversation, you know, how do I know when to exit, right? So when to exit is a more difficult one because you may see it go all the way up and also come all the way down, right? And, and so, uh, so if you see this was, you know, in terms of screener that we looked at, uh, various uh, parameters, we also look at promoter holding as part of it. This was sort of the price trend of the particular company, you know, and uh, just to give you a perspective of when we sort of went into an exit, right? When we saw, you know, volume growth flattening, right? So sometimes when you're studying it in detail, you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at, at it objectively, right? Data shows up. And, and if the thesis for you for investing in it was, okay, we are going to see earnings growth and we're going to see it continuing to grow, but you start to see flattening, then it's possibly also time to exit a particular stock, okay? So not only the entry, but also the exit is what I'm saying. And I promise to give something on risks, okay? Uh, at times like this, you know, at least I am very worried, okay? Because uh, markets have done very well, right? Uh, in fact, one of the portfolios, we took a contrarian call, you know, in 23 March, and we said mid and small caps are going to do well. They were doing very poorly at that time because you had the Silicon Valley Bank crisis, in India you had Adani crisis, FIs are pulling out large money, right? So there was a lot of uncertainty, but still, and that time mid and small caps were doing worse, right? So, so, it, so what did we, uh, we came out with a call when we looked at the markets and stuff, said that valuations on, so mid and small caps are low, especially small caps, and we felt uh, it'll do well. We came out with a new fund, right, uh, in March, and that particular thing did almost like 45% April to August, okay? Uh, so, so the point is, uh, now that is a great journey, but what is my problem that I'm saying? My problem that came after that is everybody then wants to come on. 
after 45 percent is over, right? So what we actually did is we, we closed the fund for subscription, okay? Because we thought that's the time when we'll probably get the most money because that investor will be willing to invest the most. But we said it's not the right thing for the customer because many times they are not able to see it. We thought there'll be volatility. We closed it. There was some bit of volatility. We opened it again and closed it. Okay. Right? So, so right now we in closed mode. Okay. But the point I'm making is when I get worried, when a client of mine who say 75 years plus, who was a little concerned about the volatility in his portfolio, say about a year back, right? Uh, coming back and saying, my friend told me that, you know, these particular uh, PSU stocks have given him 40%. Okay, and that gets me worried because I mean, investors typically there. So, I'm saying the risk for all of you is to keep in mind that market has moved a bit. Okay, so we are going to see volatility. The India growth story is great. Okay, the only thing is it's not going to happen overnight. And if you see, and I asked him the same thing that if something has delivered 45% in the last year, because he told me, why don't we invest in that fund? Okay, I told him. Do you think it will grow 45% in this year as well? Then he said, okay, okay, maybe let me <laughs> hold on to it, right? So, so that is the point that I'm trying to make to you that we have to relook at our expectations and that's very, very important. And possibly at a time like this, right? So the question is, should I not invest? Should I wait? Okay, it's like somebody told, right? Uh, I've also seen clients who exited at uh, or even prospective clients who exited at COVID, okay, and they never came back in, okay, waiting still, okay. Of course, we at Right Horizons, we did the opposite, okay. We took a contrarian call and on our fund, we went all in on the fateful day, March 23rd, when the index froze twice, right. So, so I'm, so I'm just saying that uh, you need to train your mind in some form to say that after great earnings, maybe it will slow down. But at the same time, it's almost impossible to predict, okay? Uh, that may have been a lucky one. The timing was almost perfect, right? It's not always that even we get it right to the month. Sometimes we may expect markets to correct. It may take one year, right? It may take six months, right? So, so the point that I'm making is that we have to be aware that, you know, the, uh, markets have been strong. There could be corrections. And it may just be that some of these stocks are too overheated. Okay, so if one wants to look at it, uh, I got the other extreme. A family office client came back and said, okay, I want to put X amount, it was a slightly large one. And he said, do you want me to give you the money? I said, I said yeah, I'll take part of it and I'll phase it in. Right, because my point to her was, you know, I may be wrong, right? And if I think that the India growth story is so compelling, uh, it's okay to be slightly wrong, but if I miss out, you know, the larger money for trying to, say, manage 15% volatility, okay, it's, it's a bit of a problem. But, but the point I'm also making is, if we then are ready for the volatility, which we've told our clients, okay, of course, in some of our portfolios, we've increased a bit of cash level, we've looked at the stocks that we have, but we don't think it's a, you know, is, we don't believe it's a cycle turning fall, right? So from there we want to manage risk and for each of this we look at it at different levels. So, so I'm, the important thing I'm saying is that you need to look at risk as well. You need to see can you afford that? Okay, do you have liquidity? And do you have also some money to keep in case markets are volatile? And if you have money possibly stagger it at a time like this, right? So an STP type of approach is uh, a very, very good approach to take. So, so you have a whole lot of risk to keep in mind. Okay, at a company level also you have a combination of like on some stocks I think it's just a valuation risk. Company may be great, nothing will happen to it, right? But valuation may have run ahead of its time, right? So, so that's something that we look at. You may have, of course, the worst is you have corporate governance risk. Okay, which is why it's important to try and look at your stocks and see whether you know, there are issues out there. Okay, and uh, for us, I, I've been, if you, you know, you will gather from my conversation that I've been talking about risk, risk, risk. And uh, so our whole focus is on how do we deliver a risk-adjusted return. And this gives us great joy when 
you know, we see not only, you know, uh, has it done better than the index. Of course, even if I look at it, was the mid cap uh, index. Uh, unfortunately, SEBI came out and said, you know what, you need to have one index, right? And uh, so BSE 500 got into a lot of them, okay, because we didn't have any, any index smaller than BSE 500 uh, as an option to benchmark, because they only gave three indices to look at. So uh, even if you look at on the mid cap index, you'll find that uh, we've done uh, pretty well. The good part that and we like is even when the fall happened, you would have found that the fall will be lesser. And this is a BSC 500, so possibly a mid cap index would have fallen even more, right? So, so that's the point to keep in mind that, uh, you know, and, and I think this is something for yourself. You can measure quality. What happened to my portfolio share when market fell? Uh, yeah, so some of these numbers are there. So I will uh, also look at, you know, just if I look at themes, what is it, some of it that we are saying, of course, these are uh, stocks that we may also hold. So we've not given the names, but this is something that uh, we continue to look at. And even at the current point, uh, we believe there are companies where we think earnings can double. We think that P multiples can also expand. Okay, so uh, some of them are there, but yes, uh, be aware that that could be volatility ahead. Okay, and again, what are some of the themes? I think a lot of it is moving towards, uh, like somebody also said earlier, the 2001 to 2008 uh, time frame, right? The similar uh, stocks that are there. Uh, we've avoided real estate. We took building materials, okay, because we find that sector slightly cleaner. Okay, of course, in recent time, there was some thing that came out in with respect to one of the companies there as well. So, uh, so you know, things have been very good. So, if you see, uh, crazy, and, and this is my problem, right? It's a good problem to have, but we try to tell clients, if you think it will give you 42% of 38% for the next three years, I don't think so, right? But if you stagger it, probably in the future, uh, you know, getting something which is still handsome for you and to help you on your wealth creation, definitely, I think that is something which is possible. Okay, thank you.